We've dismissed Mr. Bothy, and we've kept his approved provisional denture. We've taken it back into the lab. We've rinsed it off. And so our goal now is we want to be able to provide him with that duplicate denture that he can wear. This is the technique that we'll be doing this weekend. And this is such a luxury to have because we never have to rush the lab. And let me tell you this, with a duplicate denture, this is a great technique for your staff to learn to do. You don't need to get back there and do it yourself. You can show them this video if you want. You can use the manual that, that I'm going to provide you in this course. And they can take it upon themselves to learn how to do this because this is a, a great technique. And in terms of materials and resources, money, it's not going to cost that much to do this for a patient. Before we refresh his dentures, we want to put these into a jig. This is a Lang duplicating jig. It's basically a clamshell that we can immerse the dentures in so that we can take them out and make a duplicate. I'm in the process of making a new jig because the Lang duplicating jig is made to use alginate impression material. And what you do is you put alginate in, make an impression on one side of the denture, put alginate in this side, close it down, make an impression on the other side, pull it out, and then you make your duplicate in there from the alginate. The problem with that is the alginate has a tendency to tear very easily. And you are rushed to get the diagnostic denture made. So what we're going to use instead of alginate is lab putty. What it does for you is it's resistant to tearing and, and, and breaking when you pull the denture out. But the other thing is it's stable long term. So you can just sit it over on the counter and get back to it when you've got some time. And so the different steps can be done during your day instead of having to get it done right then while the alginate is fresh. A lot of people have converted to using putty in their Lang duplicators. The problem is the putty gets so locked into all these undercuts, it's really hard to get the putty out. So we're in the process of making a duplicating flask that actually has the sides open up and you can just slide the, the putty out. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the Lang duplicating jig is large enough for the denture. I've actually had a denture come through that was too big to fit in the jig. They make an old jig that is extra large that you can hang around with, but most all dentures are going to fit into the Lang duplicating jig. Okay? Now, how many scoops of putty are you going to use in this thing? We've kind of gone through it over the years, and for an upper denture on either side, you want to use 8 to 10 scoops, 8 to 10 scoops of putty. We've measured, we've measured out 8 scoops, this little scoop bowl, and here's our accelerator. But I think what's an easy way to determine if you've got enough putty is before you put any accelerator in, Go ahead and stick it down into the jig. It's not going to set. And put your denture down in there and kind of see if you've got enough. And I'd say we need one more scoop, Kathy, if you could do that for me. Then I can just pull Mr. Bothy's denture out and then pull the unset putty out and just add one more scoop. So that way you're not mixing way too much or you're not going to end up not having enough when you close your jig down. So, we've got seven scoops. We've got nine? That's right. Oh, excuse me. Nine scoops. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That one's a little short right there. Okay. Now, we use two lines of accelerator per scoop. Now, I'll warn you about the accelerator. 
Don't squirt it out and stretch it out into a skinny line. Make the line about the size of the end of the hole. So we're going to want to, ooh, that was a little long. Don't stretch it out or you'll end up with not enough accelerator. Now, you know, the fact is this doesn't really seem all that accurate, and it's not. You'd rather have a little too much accelerator than not enough. This is Siltec lab putty. I would tell you not to use the Siltec extra hard. You'll also notice that I have on a pair of gloves. The nice thing about Siltec is the latex of the gloves will not inhibit the set of the putty. Many putties on the market, even if you've had a pair of gloves on in the last three days, it will inhibit the set. And so I prefer this. The extra hard Siltec glove powder and latex will inhibit the set. So I'm going to try and incorporate it as quickly as I can, and there's no good way to do this. You just have to act like uh, a mix master. You'd rather mix it out in your fingertips so you don't generate a lot of heat from like the palm of your hand because heat will accelerate the set of the putty. When I get a homogeneous color, I can then put it into my duplicating jig. I can take my upper denture and I'm going to go in teeth first and slide it down into the jig. And then with my finger, I can push the putty around. I can even, if I have a little excess, I can go ahead and just cleave it off right on the edge. And if I want to add to a spot, I can just take and put a little piece back there. So I can kind of move it around. Now, for all of us that were in dental school, when we boxed and beaded our dentures, you wanted to create a land area. You notice I've left the flange of the denture sticking up because I want a nice little land area that I can record. Thank you. And that putty is well on its way to setting. It takes about three or four minutes to set. You'll notice I got a little excess on the back back here. I can just take a little buffalo knife, trim that off. The other thing I always like to do is close it, make sure I'm not banging into the top of the jig. Got these little holes in here you can take a look. And I want to make sure it will close all the way down metal to metal. So I don't want anything in the way. You can see a little bit of the putty got expressed out of those holes on the back side. And so we, nice, we have a nice smooth surface. I think our putty is set enough to go ahead and put the other side on now. Interestingly enough, a lower denture typically is going to require more putty because you don't have the palate, and so you're going to have to come into the tongue space a little bit more. So if you're putting a, a lower into the duplicating jig, you may have to use ten, up to 10 scoops. Now, here is a critical step. In fact, when we, when we produce the video, we should have a blinking light, right? <laughs> okay? Let's do something silly to, to demonstrate this because... If I mix this putty and close it up, it's going to stick to this putty and you'll never be able to get it open. So what are we going to do? We're going to use a little bit of Vaseline. Okay? White petroleum jelly. And we're going to coat the surface of the putty liberally. Now, Freshened hydrocast will also stick to the putty. We learned that the hard way, didn't we, Kathy? So I'm going to put a little thin skim on my hydrocast. If you can't get into the basal seat, we got this old paintbrush that we keep for Vaseline. We paint it up inside of there. Can you get too much Vaseline? Yeah. You don't want it built up down in there. 
Can you get too little Vaseline? Yes. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go nine scoops again. Now here's the other benefit of using the putty. Okay? Suppose you've done this part and you got both hygienists waiting to be checked and you got to go finish uh, composite filling in another room. Well, just close it down. Come back to it later. If you were using alginate, you have to keep going. You can't stop. So it's the reason we use a putty. I had a dentist tell me one time, say, oh, using that putty makes it an expensive procedure. I'm sure it does. I think it's more accurate, fits into my day better, and I'm not the one paying for this. The patient's paying for it. They're our solo economic support. And so you have to pass that fee on to them. And if we're going to use putty, our duplicate denture may have to cost just a little bit more. Go ahead. Been using putty a long, long time, and there's just a million uses for it. It's very clean. And it was originally brought to the market to be used as a matrix for Gingitech, which was a soft tissue material for dye models. And then the Ivy Clark Company realized when we started doing the provisional technique that it could be used for a whole lot of things. You can actually buy putty in a five pound bucket. They come in little small buckets, but we use so much putty around the lab um, that we buy it in these big five pound buckets. It stays fresh that way. And we always order extra accelerator because as you can see, I'm a little heavy handed with the accelerator. If you don't have a pair of gloves on when you mix this, it has a tendency to the, the red stuff get all in your nail beds and uh, stains your hands up pretty bad. So wearing a pair of gloves is kind of a nice thing. This procedure can be taught to any of your lab assistants. As I said, I taught this uh, technique to both my boys. They work back in the lab in the summertime. My son Jimmy's now in dental school, and so he feels like having worked in the lab has put him way ahead. Now let me show you something. It's a, ti it's a tip. Take some putty and push it down into the denture. That way you won't get a big void in the palate or in the ridge. Then we'll put our putty in our jig and we'll slowly close it down. Thank you. <laughs> and we'll tighten this down. Now my brother used to stand up on it and squeeze it out because we're basically just creating like a denture flask. Once you've got it in the jig, we learned from Pascal and Michel Manier that putty will actually set harder if you put it in a pressure pot. So I'm going to drop it in the pressure pot uh, and let it set completely. If you don't have a pressure pot in your lab, you've got to get one. We use it for all acrylic processing, whether we're making a whether we're making a splint or a duplicate denture or processing a provisional, I think it's really important to have a good pressure pot and a safe pressure pot. This pressure pot's got a little tab that comes up under pressure and won't let you, won't let you open the pressure pot when it's under pressure. It's also got a little valve on the top of it that above 36 PSI, the diaphragm blows in there and won't let you get too much pressure in. It's also got a quick connect. I can take it off, put it back on, and not lose the pressure in my pot. It's also got a heater built in because you would like to have a little heat, a little warm water down in there. Turns on and off. The Great Lakes people uh, do a really good job, and they have supported the Dawson Academy for many, many years. Let's see what we got. Grab a towel right quick. Try and stay dry, but I'm not going to make it, huh? 
Getting this one open is a challenge. There we go. What you'll notice is there's the ridge. And if I pop this out, I'm going to be careful not to scar up my hydrocast. And there's my teeth. Now, let me show you something very interesting. We did not have enough putty when we did this one. Right here and right here. What are we going to do? Don't panic. Don't panic. We're just going to add some. Because we haven't lubricated this side, the putty's going to stick to itself right away. And the places I'm going to add are back in this corner back here. We got a good replica of the ridge. We could probably use it the way it is, but I would prefer to fill it out. A little bit up here in the front, too. When you have that purple color, you know it's in there. I think we're going to do better if we close it that way. The jig that we're talking about making, you'd be able to take it apart this way instead of a hinge. And we'll make sure we're down all the way, nothing's holding it up, and that we're metal to metal in the front. We'll drop it back in the pressure pot for just a few minutes. And then we'll pull it back out. How about that? Now you can see where we repaired it. You can tell there's a little bit of repair by the different colors, but look what it did for us right in through here. Our little repair gave us back our border on this, on this right side. It actually gave us back our border right here too. So it was important to go ahead and repair that, and this is a good thing to see. Now we can pop our denture back out. And this is being done on that day that we refresh the hydrocast. So we can just go put some comment on it, chloroform, and a fresh wash of hydrocast. Give this back to Mr. Bothy, and uh, we'll do the same thing with the lower. Here's what a lower jig looks like. Okay, there's the basal seat, and then there's the tooth side. This fits in here just like this, and it closes down. I'm not going to close it down because of long flanges. We'll try and slide it on here. Fits on there just like that. So once these are done, we refresh the dentures, we give it back to Mr. Bothy, and we've got our 24 hours for the hydrocast to refresh. During that time, I, I don't even believe you have to go just 24 hours. You can go a couple of three days. A lot of times what we'll do is we'll refresh on a Thursday afternoon, and we'll have them come in on uh, Monday or Tuesday to finalize. Um, that 24 hours is not a magical time. It's the minimum amount of time. You wouldn't want to go two or three weeks. You'd want to do it within about a three, four, five day time period. And so we'll give these back to him and then he'll come back for that finalization procedure. Okay, now what we have in our jigs is the replica of Mr. Bothy's approved provisional denture. We've got the upper and the lower and we're going to fabricate now the duplicate denture. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to make the tooth portion. You'd think maybe you could just squirt the tooth color in there and then put some pink on top of it and slam it all home and it'd work. Uh, it just doesn't work that way because the pink will get all intermixed with the white and it just turns into a mess. And so we would really like these to look pretty and, and be an exact duplicate. So I'm going to use tooth color to acrylic. Now it doesn't matter what type of acrylic you want to use. Whatever kind of acrylic that you make temporaries from, I will tell you this. If you have to have a light cured material, it's not going to work in here. The bisacryls aren't going to work in here. I'm going to use this stuff called Temp Art. I think it's made by Sultan. Um, I like the colors. I like the way it looks. Uh, it mixes with jet acrylic. We're going to use jet pink. If you use jet tooth color, that's fine too. Cold pack works fine. Any kind of methyl methacrylate is going to work. We've got some real expensive acrylics uh, alike. 
Um, Kathy, what's that acrylic that uh, we've used lately that's so expensive? New Outline. Yeah, the New Outline works really good. They have a really pretty color selection with the New Outline. Uh, but the fact is, any cold cure two color acrylic is going to work. So, what we're going to do is we're going to put a little bit of liquid into a mixing bowl. We're going to use a shade of A1, I think, mixed with a little B1. And when we make provisionals as well as, as, well as denture teeth, I also add a little clear acrylic in with it. Now, how much do I add? Personal preference. I'm going to mix the A1 and the B1 together. And I'm going to probably heavily weight it with A1. We'll look at our consistency. If you read the specs on all this stuff, it'll tell you that uh, a 3 to 1 ratio, 3 parts powder to 1 part liquid, is ideal for mixing cold cure acrylics, almost all of them. The fact is you're going to get shrinkage of the acrylic no matter how much you use. The clear acrylic in with the tooth color, and I'd recommend you use that with your provisional crowns too, will offer when you polish it a real pretty shine. We're going to put this in a monojet syringe. because I want to be in, able to inject it down into the teeth. I'm going to try and hold this so you can see it. I'll start at the second molar and then just inject around. Make sure you've gone up the buccal surface of all the teeth. And make sure you're not trapping any air bubbles in the incisal edge. I know this is kind of hard for you guys to pick up on the camera, but I'll show it to you in just a minute. I have enough material that I can do the lower anterior teeth at the same time, and I like to make the bite block in the posterior segment out of white also. I'll add just a little bit back there. Then I'll flip this over and put a little bit of monomer on my finger and just press it into the teeth. Woo! And the bite block. Get on back there. Now for you dentists that do not like lab procedures, I've only got one bit of advice for you. Get over it. Once I've got it pushed up into the teeth, the labial surfaces and the bite blocks, I always close it down. The reason we do that, the ridge could actually strike the tooth color. Now I've pushed it into the teeth and I'm going to close it down. And the reason we close it down is in case the ridge strikes the tooth color, you want it to push it out of the way. If you don't close it down and it strikes, it's going to hold the whole denture up when you put the pink on. We're going to take these and we're going to drop them in the pressure pot. Anytime we mix acrylic, we like to cure it under pressure. Then we'll let it sit in there for about 15 or 20 minutes. This is another good stopping point. You can stop, you can go do something else, return a phone call, check your hygiene, finish up a filling or a crown or something, and come back. There's no real rush at this point. So, we're all set. We'll pull our little duplicating jigs out of the pressure pot. Pop these open. And there was one area on the upper where the edentulous ridge was striking the tooth color. Now we want to be able to get the, the tooth color out of the jig. And the fit is incredibly tight. And sometimes 
there's areas of the tooth color that are very thin. If you break it when you pull it out, it's not a big deal. You're going to reassemble it when you put the pink on. And sometimes we like to break it into three pieces anyway. So we have the anterior teeth and the posterior segments. But an easy way to get this out is to lightly break the seal on the back and then use an air gun. And the air will just lift it right out of the jig. Now there's our tooth color part of the lower. We'll do the same thing on the upper and typically the upper is a little more difficult to get out. You don't want to destroy or tear up your putty, but occasionally you have to. The best place to do it is on the palatal surface. We'll use our air again. And now we have our upper tooth portion. And there's the lower. And you can see I made the little bite blocks in tooth color. If they're going to wear this as their spare denture, it's kind of nice to have the, the tooth color go all the way back instead of those big pink bite blocks. And so all we have to do now is we'll put our jigs aside. We want to trim the tooth colored portion so that it looks like teeth. We're just not going to add pink right to that. Now let me tell you something, doctors. This is the perfect vehicle, the perfect tool to teach a new staff person or someone else in the office that wants to, to learn multiple tasks to trim a provisional, to trim a temporary bridge. You don't have any margins to worry about, but there's an awful lot of good knowledge that you can get from trimming the interproximals and making it play like it's a big bridge that you're trimming. So. One of the things I like to do is use these red and blue pencils. It's a wax pencil, so it comes off easily, and it doesn't have any graphite that will stain anything up. Sometimes if you use a regular pencil, it gets all in the acrylic, and you can't really get it out of there. I'm going to outline the gingival margin of all the teeth. Now, you could end up with some areas that have a little pull like on the facial of that lateral right there. And in the posterior, I'm just going to mark little triangles, which would be the triangles that we would carve out to create embrasures. If you've been with me in any of my other courses, you know that I'm big on using a pattern. If you don't have a pattern, it's really difficult when you start trimming, you lose your perspective. So if I want to delegate this to someone who's never done it before, I can mark the blue and tell them just to trim it back to the blue line. The lingual, it's not quite as critical. And if you'd like to, you can just put a straight line across the back of the upper teeth because the lingual is basically not going to show. But like everything else, we want it to look good. We want patients to be proud of it, and us too. So what I've done with my red and blue pencil is on the lingual, I've marked the embrasures. And on the buckle, the labial, I've marked the embrasures. Okay, I can do the same thing on the lower. This goes very quickly. It doesn't take a lot of time. But it ensures success when you go about the process of trimming these things. On the lower, I'm just going to trim some little cingulums onto the backs of these teeth. And we'll open a little embrasure by the by cuspid. You saw how quickly I was able to do that? Can you guys see this? And there it is on the lingual. Now all we've really got to do is go over to the lab bench and, and just grind to the blue lines and we will have uh, a really nice product. 
when you're trimming this, the tendency is to over trim it and to trim up the labial surface like you would if you were trimming a provisional or a temporary crown. I will tell you, I've marked the labial surface in the gingival one-third with red. And what I'll tell you is to stay off of that. You don't need to touch the labial surface of these teeth because any that you remove from the labial pink when you put the next layer on, the next color on, is going to go on to that area. So you would prefer not to trim the labial surface or the lingual surface or any of the areas you, that you don't want pink to go. So let me show you how quickly we can do this. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do this side. I'm just going to do right in here. Then I'll show you how to do the back. And then we'll flip it over and we'll talk about the lingual instead of doing the, the whole thing. But you can see how quickly it, it goes. It's going to make a pretty good bit of noise. I'm going to try and talk over the noise. And I'm going to trim right to the blue line. I'm using a long, thin acrylic burr. And if you'll treat it almost like this was the root of the tooth, I'm using the very, very tip of that burr. I'm going right to the blue line, and I'm not taking any of the red off. There again, I'm going right to the blue line. What you want to avoid is having little short stubby teeth when you put the pink on. And if I'm using my pattern, what you'll notice is there's no blue line on this tooth, so I'm not going to trim that one at all. And as you go into the posterior, you'll find that you hardly have to trim any at the gingival. You're just going to have to work interproximally. I'm taking the gross acrylic off, and you can see how quickly that was done. Then I'll switch to a sandpaper disc. And when I use a sandpaper disc, this is a single sided. There's no sand on this side and there's sand on this side, which means the sand is on the side towards my trimming hand. So that what I can do with this, okay, we've gotten the gross amount of acrylic off at that gingival margin. I'm just going to open the interproximals just a little bit right to the blue line. When I use this sandpaper disc, I can go in and I can just pull it towards my hand if you watch. I can go into the interproximal and just pull it right towards my hand and go right to the blue line. I can go very quickly. I can do all the distals on the left side. I can open the interproximals between all the bicuspids, doing the distals on the left side. I can jump around to the other side and I can do the mesials of the other side. This is just maximizing your time, by the way. Notice my blue lines are still there. And I'm creating just a little bit of a root on these teeth. Now what I can do to do the other side, I'll just flip it over. Now I can do the distals of the right side and the mesials of the left side. Take as much time as you need with this. I'm just doing this real quickly so that you can get a feel for what you need to do. I can change burrs and come back with a uh, inverted cone diamond. And right at the gingival, I can create just a little tiny concavity to pick up the pink. Now what I've done is I've opened my interproximals, I've taken off the bulk at the gingival, and I haven't touched the labial surface. 
so it will inhibit the pink acrylic from going down onto the labial surface. In the posterior, I've done the same thing, but more in just opening the interproximals is all I've had to do in the posterior. There again, you still see my red marks are there. I didn't want to touch the labial surfaces. On the lingual surface, I still have my blue lines marked. I don't really want to touch any of the lingual surface of these teeth, so I'll mark those in red. This is an E-cutter burr from Brassler. We use these in the lab. They're great little burrs because they don't clog. Okay. So on the lingual, all I've really got to do is go to my blue line. I don't have to be really, 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 really accurate here because of the fact we're not in an aesthetic zone. There again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is a great tool to, to get someone acclimated to trimming acrylic, like your newest dental assistant or cross-train someone else in the office to do something because you don't have to worry about margins and and sealing teeth and all of that. You can see how fast this goes. It's just amazing how quickly you can do it. A word about magnification. A lot of dental assistants that I work with over the years and lab assistants that I work with over the years don't wear magnification. I will tell you to buy some sort of magnification. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars. You can buy a pair of clip-on magnifiers that will fit onto your safety glasses. You can get those from the Madison River Fly Fishing Catalog. That's the Madison River Fly Fishing Catalog. They're $9.95, and they work great. You can also buy a pair of safety glasses that has a little magnifier built into the bottom of it. Now what we've done is we've trimmed the lingual away. We've opened the embrasures. And on the labial, we've done the same thing. You can spend a little more time trimming and making it pretty, that sort of thing. But I would take this to the lathe now, and I would polish it with a little bit of pumice. Don't over-polish, because all the acrylic you remove is going to be replaced with pink. So just lightly polish with a little bit of pumice, and then put a little bit of uh, Sure Shine or Mall Dent, which is a acrylic polishing agent that's almost like a, a, a glazing compound on a little tiny linen wheel. This fits into my lab handpiece. You have to use this dry. Do not use this wet. The resulting product of this, after you have trimmed it and you've gone to the lathe and polished it, is a tooth portion that looks like this now. That's got a nice shine on it. The embrasures are opened up nicely. And this will be ready to receive the pink acrylic. We'll do the same thing on the lower, where we've marked the embrasures. We've marked some little cingulums on the, on the uh, lingual surface of the lower. We've even opened up some little embrasures by where the bite blocks are. And then what we'll do is we'll take that to the lathe, and our end product of opening our embrasures and polishing on the lathe will give us a smooth, shiny finish. Now, the question would be, why polish it now? Why not just polish it when we're done? You are going to get pink acrylic on this, and a highly polished surface that has some um, Vaseline or separator on it will be much easier to clean the pink off than if you hadn't polished it. So we like to go ahead and, and polish it up. Keep in mind, too, that after the pink has been put on to the highly polished surfaces of the teeth, you can always go back and open some incisional embrasures and really, really make it look pretty at that time. We just wanted to get the bulk off and get them part of the duplicate denture.
we've got our tooth portion all trimmed and polished and now we can put these back down into our duplicating jigs and add the pink base onto it. There's a couple of things that I want to really give you a heads up on about doing this part because at this point is when you can really kind of screw it up. I know that from experience. And so one of the things we concentrate very heavily on is painting the surfaces of the teeth with a lubricant. We just use white petroleum jelly and, and a brush. You can use one of those Bonifil brushes or what have you. This is an old porcelain technician's brush. When they get ready to throw them away, I ask them to save them for me, and they usually have a whole drawer full of them. And what I'm going to do is very liberally put Vaseline in the interproximal and on the labial surface and on the lingual surface. I will tell you take your time doing this. I'm also going to put some on the occlusal surfaces of the teeth. What that'll do is if the pink does get down, and it will get onto the teeth, it will be much more easily removed if the surface is lubricated. Notice I said easier to remove. It's not necessarily going to be easy to get it off. Sometimes you have to just grind it off. Now the part of the tooth that's going to receive the pink is the bottoms of the teeth, which would be the gingival surfaces, and some of the interproximal. Once you've got this on there pretty heavy, we'll move to our jig and we'll push it down in. A lot of times I'll just take an instrument and pop it down into the hole. You can see what a nice, accurate, firm seat that's going to be. Now, Kathy's taken the opportunity before I got over here to lubricate the lower and pop it into the jig. Now the Vaseline will form a little bit of a suction and it will hold it in place now all we've got to do is put the pink acrylic on. What pink acrylic shall we use? I use jet pink. I have found over the years that it's about the, the easiest to do. But one of the things we've got to think about, are we going to put hydrocast in our duplicate? I would encourage you to do it. You don't have to. You can just go with all acrylic. You'll have to adjust it a lot as the patient wears it. But I would recommend that you put a thin film of hydrocast. But to do that, if we're going to put hydrocast, we have to provide a space for that hydrocast. There's an easy way to do this. Um, we just use one sheet of base plate wax over the surface of the, of the tissue. When we process the pink, then we peel the base plate wax out and we have a space for the hydrocast. We warm a piece of base plate wax. One of the, e one of the best places to keep some wax warm all the time is your pressure pot. The water stays a pretty constant temperature. You can just float some wax in there, and uh, it'll stay nice and soft for you and workable. And as you know, I like to warm wax in, uh, in hot water instead of a flame. I'll use about a half a sheet, and all I'm going to do is just press it on to the ridge, if you will. Now, it's not going to stick very much because... It just won't stick to putty. There again, the thickness of a, beast, a piece of base plate wax is one and a half millimeters. And so if we can kind of keep a fairly uniform thickness, then we're going to get a nice uniform thickness of hydrocast. I'll just take a Bard Parker knife and try not to scar up my putty. I'll just trim that wax right off of there. And when we're doing this as a group, work together and work to make sure and follow in your manual and you'll end up with a really nice end product and ready to receive hydrocast. What we used to do is we'd go ahead and process it and then we'd take a great big acrylic burr and grind out and create space for the hydrocast. Uh, this just saves time more than anything. 
Back here in the back, you want to make sure you don't extend over to this so that you, you hold the, the jig open. And then you want to make sure that the jig will close all the way when you've got the pink base plate wax on there. Okay? I'll take a hot instrument like a Cottrell spatula. I'll put it in a flame, and I'm just going to loop that down lightly. Get a couple of hot dogs, and we can sing around the campfire, too. A very famous dentist once said, you can't go through life with a cold spatula. And I believe him. Only reason I'm looting this down is just so it doesn't move around on us when we put the pink in. And I'd really rather the pink not go up under the base plate wax. We'll check it one more time. Now that one's ready to go. If we do the lower real quick. I kind of check to see what size I want because the lower sometimes you, you use a little bit more than a half a sheet. Save those little pieces because you can use them for something else. When we made our stops in our approved provisional denture, we mixed hydrocast liquid with acrylic and it stayed soft. The reason we knew that would happen was because one day I was making a duplicate denture and I picked up the hydrocast liquid instead of the liquid for the uh, acrylic and I couldn't figure out why that acrylic never set until Kathy reminded me that I picked up the wrong bottle. And so like a lot of things happen in life, that's how we learned by mistake that uh, we could use that as a nice soft stop in our approved provisional dentures. You almost do this like you would do a custom tray block out. I tell you the other thing you can do is you can just pull it off of there if you want to. Trim it out in your hand and put it right back on. We could dunk the whole thing back in the water too if we wanted to. Get it right to a good temperature. Excuse me. I'm just tucking it in on the lingual now and into that retromyelohyoid fossa. Got a little excess right here by the genial tubercle. Okay, I'll do the same thing we did on the upper and I'll just lightly loot this down. checking it to make sure it's closed. And now we've got a little uniform thickness of block out in the areas that we really want that block out to be right over the top of the ridge. We can trim the border down anytime we want to when we're making this. Okay. Now, we've got our block out. We have our tooth portion trimmed. It's lubricated. We can now mix up and place our pink acrylic on top. What we have found over the years is if you'll salt and pepper in a little bit of pink first before you make a big mix, then you'll get a much better seal around all the teeth. These are K-A-Y-O-N, K -A -Y -O -N, custom stains. The acrylic is a bunch of different colors. This color is kind of a blue or a purple color. They have a little red color. They have pink. They have white, and then they have fibered pink. They have a bunch of different colors, and what you can do is custom characterize your duplicate denture just like you would your final denture. And as you can see, they've got a little blue up in the vestibule area, up in here, and they've got a little white that comes up to simulate a root surface coming up through the tissue. Sometimes we do this but most of the time we just mix up regular pink just because the patient's only going to wear it for a couple of weeks. It's not really going to show. And if you've got a patient with a real high lip line and they show some pink, you might want to go ahead and custom characterize it. But frankly, that's not easy to do and you can end up with some really bad looking dentures. You know, all of a sudden you've got brown and purple 
gums all over the place. Let's start by doing a little salt and pepper, and I'm just going to paint a little acrylic liquid down around the teeth in the areas that I want to pick up the pink powder. And then I'll just sprinkle in a little bit of the pink, and it's going to pick up all the liquid. This pretty much keeps you from getting big bubbles in the interproximal. This is also the way you'd put your custom stain on. You'd wet it with liquid. And then you'd add the powder in the areas that you want the stain. I got it good and wet still, so I'm going to add a little bit more powder. You'll actually see bubbles come up from in between the teeth. And that's a good thing because you're not going to end up with bubbles in your final. And just so that you can see how we would do the, the custom stain, I'm going to create vascular beds. This is easy to do, by the way. And one of the things that the lab does is they, they put these little vascular beds on either side of the palate. And so what I can do is I can add some of this purple color on either side. I'll run some right down the middle. And I'll hold it there with a little bit of liquid. And if this happens to be noxious, it's in the palate instead of being out. And how about some white? And then I'll highlight that with a little bit of white. I can also hit the root surfaces with a little bit of white. Just breaks up the color just a little bit. And then we'll tack it down with some liquid. If you have somebody in your office that's very creative and very artistic, this would be a, a project that they could do and really get good at. We're going to go ahead and close this down now. We have to set this before we put the pink on because if you put it on now, it would push all of that freshly cured or freshly put acrylic down. So Kathy will drop it in the pressure pot for me. And then we're going to do the same thing on the lower. We're going to coat the surfaces that we want to pick up that, that pink. And particularly in those buckle embrasures. As you can see, this goes pretty fast also. We'll shut this down. We'll drop that in the pressure pot. And then we'll give those a couple of minutes to set. And we're not going to pull them out. We'll mix up pink and add to them. OK, now we've popped these out of the pressure pot. And our first little salt and pepper and our custom staining has set for us now. So that when we put this next bulk layer on, it's not going to be pushed out of the way and, and run everywhere. Sometimes when you open this up, the wax will, will dislodge and be stuck down to the lower. Just pop the wax back down on there. It's okay. It's just a spacer is all the wax is. The wax can be hard to get out of the pink acrylic, so I'm just going to put a little thin covering of Vaseline on that wax. It'll be much easier for us to get it out when we've processed this. And... Uh, Anytime we can make the job a little bit easier, we always like to. So now I'm going to mix up my bulk pink layer. And I'm going to put enough in here that I will have an excess. You'd rather have more of this than not enough. You notice I'm using the little Hydrocast mixing cups. They're a little bit bigger in volume than some of these other cups that we have. And I've got pink... Lang, I mean pink jet acrylic, which is made by Lang, and, uh, and we mixed in a little bit of clear so we can get a nice shine on it when we're done. And I'm just going to slowly incorporate that until we get our stiff mix.
This is referred to as pour acrylic. That's why. It's because you can actually pour it. And I'm going to pour a little bit onto the palette. And just let it slowly, almost like you were pouring up a cast. Now with my monojet syringe, I'll add to that, and I'll go into my vestibule below that wax and make sure that I don't get a huge bubble in the vestibule. Now if you're not using the wax, it is, it's even more critical. And I'm hoping that we will have some excess. I'll close this down. Oh, yeah. And you can see the excess come out. At this point, I can clear that with my finger. And I want to keep pushing and keep expressing the extra pink. And then I'll use my little sc screw down until I feel like I'm metal to metal. As I said, you want a little excess, and that's really not a, a gross excess. With the new DC jig, we'll actually have three of these so that you get a continuous pressure all the way around since we won't have a, a hinge on the back. Now, we'll drop this in the pressure pot. We've taken the upper duplicate denture and we've taken it out of the pressure pot and we've teased open the, the jig. Sometimes it's kind of hard to get these out of here, but you'll see how easily the little flanges break off. Any bubbles or voids that you're going to have up inside the basal seat of the denture will uh, gonna fill in with uh, hydrocast anyway. What we would hope when we first pull this thing out is that it looks like a denture, by the way. <laughs> and as you can see, in fact, I'm real pleased with this one because we got virtually no pink on the teeth. We've picked up the teeth that we trimmed and working really hard on them to make them look pretty has really benefited us. And then if you look at the lingual, it's going to be a simple matter to trim. Here's my little custom characterization tries. And I learned from a, a laboratory technician one time, if you want to try something creative, do it on the disto buckle of an upper second molar. Nobody will ever see it but you. And if it looks good, then you can try it in some other part of the mouth. And so this is our denture right out of the jig. Now all I have to do is trim up this excess which is going to take almost no time, and, uh, and then peel our wax out. The wax just comes out using a buffalo knife. It's going to provide a space for the hydrocast. We have taken the time to really clean the wax out of the duplicate denture and spend some time and get all of the wax out of this duplicate denture because you know that's going to provide the space for us so that we can put hydrocast in this space and have a hydrocasted duplicate denture for Mr. Bothy to wear while we keep his approved provisional denture to process, to do our final processing. I've taken the opportunity and just trimmed the excess off. There was very little excess as you saw when we took it out of the jig. I've gone ahead and removed a little bit of the excess off the teeth. I've also taken the opportunity to trim the border down just a little bit. Just took an acrylic burr. This is the burr that I use. Just take a little acrylic burr and trim that border down because I want the hydrocast to get over the border and give us borders in hydrocast. The other thing that we've done is polish the denture with a little bit of pumice and sure shine or some sort of acrylic polishing agent. This will go right back into our duplicating jigs 
and then we can lubricate these and put hydrocast in them. The hydrocasted duplicate dentures are very, very comfortable to the patients, and they can wear them for an indefinite period of time. What that does for us, it gives the lab an opportunity to take all the time they need to really make a nice final product. I've pretty much got the upper denture completed and ready to receive hydrocast. The lower now, as you can see, I haven't polished, but you can see the tooth portion and even the bite blocks in tooth color. I've also removed the wax from inside, the internal surface, and I've trimmed off any flash and cut my borders down just a little bit. What we'll do is take this to the lathe now. We'll hit this with a little pumice. We'll polish it. And let me tell you why we polish it now. The reason we polish it now is because once we have the hydrocast in it, we really don't want to take it back to the lathe and get pumice all in our hydrocast or catch the hydrocast on the lathe. We'd rather go ahead and polish it, make it smooth, make it shiny, then put our hydrocast and we don't have to go back to the lathe.